Well, we want to welcome you to the 1130 Wednesday lunch and Bible study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We are in a series called The Foundational Doctrines of the Holy Spirit. You'll recall from our last lesson, I know our last lesson would have been last week because I'm not able to get here every Wednesday. I hope to be able to get into that situation, but I have other other engagements. But I'm back with the foundation. Of, we have had one, I think, maybe one doctrine introduction to this program. But anyhow, last, last time we met, we studied the introduction uh, to this new series called The Foundation Doctrines of the Holy Spirit, which were taught by Jesus at the Last Supper. That would, the Last Supper period would be John 13 through 17. He taught uh, the foundation doctrines of the Holy Spirit. This is really important to the church, and I think the church has failed in understanding the foundation doctrines that he taught about the Holy Spirit, which he said would come not many days after his ascension, which would be Pentecost. Now, he taught these doctrines at the Last Supper, he dies on a cross, he's buried on third day, raised from the dead, which, by the way, is the gospel for those who are visiting with us. That is the gospel. It is that which you must believe to be saved, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to everyone who believes that he died for their sins, was buried and raised on the third day to give him eternal life. Well, That, that's in Romans 1.16, by the way. So Jesus is, is teaching these. He, he taught a lot of doctrines I'm going to show you. I'm focusing in this series on just the doctrines that he taught on the Holy Spirit. But he taught on them prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. Then he spends 40 days of post-resurrection appearances teaching his disciples on the same subject matter. Now, he's going to teach other doctrines as well, but he's going to come back and he's going, to, he's going to study, make them understand that the next event coming up, other than his ascension, is going to be the advent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so he's preparing his guys uh, because they're going to have, they, they are going to be the apostles uh, and uh, prophets as set teachers uh, to the church. And so... What I'm doing is I'm going back to John 14, 15, and 16, where he covers this, and I'm going to study the specific doctrines. I'm still in an introductory stage of introducing them because I'll tell you, people read the Bible, and the Bible they don't give the Bible a chance to read them. They don't read the Bible for way enough information. And so I'm going to try to show you today a way to read the Bible, to study the Bible in the way, if, for example, when Jesus was teaching, I'm going to show you what all he taught that is often missed because we don't pay attention uh, to the importance of, of the different subjects that he was covering in the Last Supper. So today, I'm going to do that with you. Um, I think it will be important. These doctrines uh, were taught uh, to prepare the disciples of the followers of Christ for the church age. And certainly, they're the foundation doctrines of the church, these doctrines of the Holy Spirit. Now today, after a word of prayer, we're, I'm going to cover five aspects of a uh, the foundation doctrines of the Holy Spirit. I call it the first one because that's where we're headed towards the first one. Uh, and here's what's important. And this is what my study is going to show you. You've got to study the Bible. You've got to study it like you're going to take a test. Not like you're going to pass one, but you're going to take one. See, my doctrine that I want to talk about next week next time we meet, comes from what's called the Philip section. 
So you have to understand that. And so I've got, I've got to teach you some ways, at least in my congregation, those who study under me, how to study the Bible to get the proper information. And so the Philip section is John 14, 8 through 21. The passage I want is 16, 17, and 18. That's the first foundation doctrine that Jesus taught at the Last Supper. But it comes from the Philip section. And that's only one of three sections. That's very important to your study. So let's have a word of prayer. And uh, listen, you're going to have to have, look, look, you've got to get your Bible. I'm going to have a word of prayer. Get your Bible. Get a pencil and paper and take notes. Later, you can come back. If you haven't already pulled down your notes from our website, you can come back later and pull them down. But take notes. You're going to have to take notes. You, there's no way you can remember all this. Uh, and it's very important. If you want to learn about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church age, you've got to listen to the teachings of Jesus. So let's prepare to study. Let me begin by telling you the Bible. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the church age is personal sin. Carnality and personal sin. Like you can compare 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, 1 through 3, to 1 John 1, 9. Ha, carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue, or overt. Just to mention three categories for you. Listen, the Holy Spirit should convict you. Your conscience should convict you. The Word of God convicts you. How many convictions do you need to know that you're carnal because of personal sin. You've committed sin. How do I know what sin is? You study the Bible, and the Bible tells you what sin is. Now, how do I get out of carnality and his spirituality, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, so that he can teach me the truth? He's called the spirit of truth by Jesus in these passages. He's called the spirit of truth because his job is to teach you and recall, disclose, and guide you into all truth. So how do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality, indwelling Holy Spirit? I confess my sin. The key word in 1 John 1, 9 for me is the word cleanse. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. Cleansing takes us to the cross in the blood of Christ. For the unbeliever, he believes the gospel and it cleanses us from Adamic sin. But for the believer, you see, 1 John 1, 9 is for the believer. When the believer is in carnality, living in the flesh, shouldn't be because he has the indwelling Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What does he do to get out of the flesh, carnality or sin nature, and back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit? He confesses his sin, and when he does... The blood of Christ on the cross works to the believer's life to restore him to spirituality. It's not about salvation. It's about spirituality, the dynamics of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to give you a moment. Examine your life in regard to personal sins. It could be mental attitudes, sins, tongue of word sins. Make those confessions in silence and privacy to the Father. Let the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of truth, teach you all truth today. You're going to need him. You can't study the Bible. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality, dear heart. So let's take a moment. Father, we want to thank you today for the marvelous grace system that you have for us as a believer in the church age to confess our sin, to be restored to spirituality, the dynamics of the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach us not only what the truth is, but how to live it out into our life that brings glory to God. I pray today, Father, that would be the exercise of our hearts today as we look how to study the Bible just to get the dynamics of a certain passage of scriptures on the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at five things about how to, how to, um, how to understand a section of scripture when it's tied to a larger section of Scripture. 
mean, you're not going to find people reach in the Bible and they get a scripture and they bring it out and nine times out of 10, they'll take it out of context because the context tells you what it's all about. Look, here's how the Bible is written in simplistic form. God reveals his truth to the writer of whatever book you're reading in the, in the Bible. Like mine is John. John, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, takes what God told him and puts it into a form to tell somebody else. That would be, for me, a reader. In the context, it would be something else. In other words, who was John writing to? Your, a good study Bible will tell you in an introduction to the book of John who John was writing to, who, why he was writing, what period of time he was writing. All of that's important to John's view. So God tells John, and John writes it down to tell the reader. He writes it. It's a written book. It's a written. He wrote it for the reader. Now, I'm a pastor teacher. And so for me as a reader, I look at it to share with a congregation for spiritual growth like I'm doing today. Another person, a, a believer, would read it to find out some information for his life. And when he found that, he would share it with other people, how the word of God works in the Christian life, how it, how it becomes a Hebrews 4.12, how it becomes a critic uh, of the thoughts and intentions of the heart, a critic and judge of that. And so, you know, we learn it, I learn it, in a different way than the average person would. I'm learning it to share with a congregation for spiritual growth momentum in their life. But listen, you should study it for, it, for it is the word of God that brings transformation by the renewing of your mind, what the will of God is. The word brings the will, and the will brings the work of God to your life, the divine production system. So it's very important you understand. So. The first thing I want to talk to you about is two hermeneutic principles that are very important for when you study the Bible. Two hermeneutic pr principles of interpretation of Scripture. And I'm going to apply it to my today's lesson. The first principle, so that you can get it. Today's first principle, the first thing you do in hermeneutics is you always, if you're looking for a text, you always study it in context. Now, if you have a good study Bible, they break it down for you. They'll, they'll take a chapter, and they'll break it down into context as a rule. If you have a study Bible, like, like mine, I'm in John 14 today. We'll, in a moment, we'll read 16, 17, 18. I have the New American Standard Ryrie Study Bible, and... They break it down 1 through 6. They break it down again 7 through 15. They break it down again 16 through 20 through 31. So what they're trying to do is they're showing. So if, if for example, if, if, you wanted, if you wanted to teach on John, uh, John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You, you, would, you would be expected to read the context in which it came from, which is verses 1 through 6. And listen, you would also be obligated to look back to see what larger context it might have come from. For example, in verse 1 of John 14, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You, you should ask troubled about what? So you would have to go back to the 13th chapter, and you would have to begin to read at least ver verse 36 and on when the disciples began to ask him questions, which we'll do today, by the way. So the first hermeneutic principle, if you want a, if you want a text, if you want a verse, you've got to look at the verse's context. And there is, there is a context of the verse, and there's a greater context of the context. Sometimes you need to be aware of that as you read the Bible. 
because it will give you a lot more information about what, what was happening when Jesus makes a statement. Now, the second hermeneutical principle is very important is because we're looking at, we want a text, we're going to look at the context, the simple context, and the larger context. All right? For example, when, when my passage, if you look at John 14, 6, 17, 16, 17, and 18, I'm going to show you something now. Here's what it says. I will ask the Father, and, and look, my, mine has red print, and there's a lot of it here. He says, and I will, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter. An, the word another, as you know, means another of the same kind. Jesus was the comforter. He was the helper. He's leaving. This, the third member of the Godhead is coming in, or the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that he may be with you forever, the Holy Spirit. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and you will be in him. And listen, here's the difference of you, a believer from the world, I will not leave you an orphan. I will come to you. I will not leave you an orphan. Without parental guidance. An orphan. See, all of that has to do with the Holy Spirit's ministry to you. And he's talking to the disciples. Jesus is going to leave him, them, and there's going to be a 10-day period where they're going to be an orphan. They're not going to have Jesus. They're not going to have the Holy Spirit as prescribed. He's going to breathe on them, and it's going to hold them intact for 10 days. And they're going to receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and they're never, ever going to be an orphan again. Only a small picture, picture or a window of orphan. See, you got to know that stuff. What's he mean, an orphan? Listen, I was born in Adam, illegitimate. And now I've become an orphan. Well, he's talking to the disciples. And when that day of Pentecost comes, you'll never be an orphan again because the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, the other comforter will abide with you. You see, you got to know that stuff. Listen, how do I know that? Because I looked at the greater context of the discussion, the teachings of the, of the Last Supper. See, you got to know this stuff. At least my people do. My people that come to my church have got to know this stuff. Yeah, I don't want them to be ignorant of the truth, dear brother. They got to know how the Holy Spirit works in their life. They got to know how, to, how the Holy Spirit wants them to study how God wrote it out through the different writers. I mean, I, I'm just telling you the way I teach it, and I, it's been important because, see, my passage, 16, 17, and 18, listen, it comes from the Philip section. <laughs> see, you got to know that. This comes from the Philip section. It starts in verse 8. It starts in verse 8 and goes through 21. Philip said to him, and Jesus answers Philip. And, and, and then Judas, is, Judas, not Iscariot, is going to ask him another question. I'm not interested in the next question because I want to teach on the first foundation doctrine that Jesus taught his disciples on the Holy Spirit. But you see, in order for me to do that, I've got to look at the context. And there's a greater context than that that I have to investigate. It's not because I'm a pastor. I do it because my people need to know this. I am the, I am the pastor teacher of a congregation of spiritual growth. But you should want to know this. You should want to know that this is how you study the Bible. You just don't read through it. Well, I've read through the Bible uh, one time, uh, two times, three times a year. Yeah, but what's, it, what's between your ears? What's between your ears that is changing your life? 
My, my, my. Now, the greater, listen, the greater context. Now, the context I want for my passage is John 8 through 21. But there's a greater context to that that goes all the way back to verse 36 when the disciples begin to ask him questions. And it's going to go on after. But you see, in order, in order for me to teach in my passage, I've got to teach you about the Philip section. But you see, in order for me to do that, I'm at point two. In order for me to do that, I've got to teach you that there's a, a Peter section that led to a Thomas section that led to a Philip section, and the Philip section is where my study comes from. But I can't do that because it's in a series of questions that all pertain to what my lesson is going to be about. All right, I'm going to show it to you. Yeah, look, it's all in the Bible. I, look, at when I get to Philip, Philip said to him, I start looking back, and I go back to verse 5, and Thomas said to him. I go back to verse 36 of the thir 13th chapter. Simon Peter said to him. Now, look, it's a serious... Peter asked some questions. Look, let me just show it to you. Uh, go to 1336. Simon Peter said to him, Jesus, Lord, where are you going? See, he's been teaching on him going. Where are you going? Where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? See, that's a question. See, Peter has asked, look, it's important. Peter asked how many questions? In the Peter section, how many questions did he ask? Two. And they led to answers. The answer Jesus gave to him, right? He asked another question. Why can I not follow you now? Uh, and then he makes a statement. I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered him with a counter question. Because Peter's not getting Jesus' point. Counter questions are used to try to get your point across. Peter's used two of them. Jesus used a counter question because Peter's not listening. Will you lay down your life for me? Really? Then he gives them a truly, truly. This is a giant thing. When Jesus says truly, truly, I say to you, boy, you better listen. Truly, truly, I say to you. I mean, this should be bold print, and it should be written down, studied, because you're going to see it on a test. I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you, Peter, a cock shall crow shall not crow until you deny me three times. Now, you can read about it in Matthew 26, 69 through 75, the story. See, there's the Peter section. See, listen, and Jesus doesn't stop there now. It goes into chapter 14. This is still in the Peter section. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I can't tell you how important that is when you're, when you're holding the hand of someone who is dying to go to that place. Listen, honey. You know, I say to my wife every night, honey, when your place is made ready, you will be welcomed in hotel heaven. That's what I tell her. I tell her that every night before I go to bed and she lay, closes her eyes. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. See, that's the Peter section. Thomas asked a question. It's caused Thomas to ask a question. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Question. He made, he made a statement and then asked a question. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Answer, verse 6 and verse 7. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, 
you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. That brings a question from Philip. Now we're in the Philip section. That's my section. I'm going to teach from that. Not today, but I'm going to teach from it. Next time. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is enough for us. I mean, now, what did Jesus just tell Thomas? He told Thomas, from now on, you know him and have seen him. Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be enough for us. So he's not getting it either. Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? Question. Say, that's a counter question. Why did Jesus give him a counter question? Because they're not getting the point. We've gone from Peter to Thomas to Philip. They're not getting the point, and so he gives a counter question. Boom, there it is. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? Another counter question. You're not getting it. Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Counter question. You're not getting it. The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own initiative, but the Father abides in me, does his work. Watch the word believe from verse 10 on. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe according, uh, on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, boom, boom, boom. Are you getting it? I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I shall do, he shall do, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may be with you forever that the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you within you. I will not leave you an orphan. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more, but you will behold me because I live, you shall live also. In that day, Pentecost. After a little while, Pentecost. In that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments, as stated, and keeps them, he is he who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. That's my Philip section. You see, you can't, I want to, I want to teach verses Chapter 14, I want to teach 16, 17, 18. It's one of 14 doctrines that I list for you that I could teach my congregation. There's probably more. I just picked out 14 just to give you a bird's eye view of what is in this passage. I'm only pulling one out of it. You cannot, get to, you cannot get to my passage without understanding the Philip section. You can't understand the Philip section without understanding the Thomas section. You can't understand the Thomas section without the Peter section. They are connected to what Jesus is teaching. I wrote all that on your paper. Today's lesson comes from a progression of questions from three of Jesus' disciples, Peter, Thomas, and Philip, during the Last Supper, the upper room, chapter 13, 36, through the fourth chapter, 14th chapter, verse 21. I read to you Peter, Thomas, and Philip's account. I recorded for you 14 doctrines that I could teach my congregation and have taught and will teach again as Jesus did his disciples from the greater passage of John 13, 36 through 41. All right? So here they are. 
And what I'm trying to do is to show you the dynamics. See, what I'm showing you is a correct way to study the Bible. It's called ICE. You have to study it in order to teach it. ICE. ICE agaki, that's the historical setting and background of, the, of whatever scripture you're after. Category. That's, that's where your people are going to grow spiritually is through categorical thinking of the word of God. That's what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to do. And they're all, they're all over the place. Exegeting. That's the dynamics of being able to see. For example, in English, you got a question mark. In the Greek, they show you it's a question. Also, the dynamics. When I get into my passage of chapter 14, 16, 17, 18, I'll look at the exegeting of it. Now, I've already studied all of it in the exegeting, but when I get down my passage, I'll show you what is really unique and important about the Greek language for our understanding. Now, I want to show you the Peter section. I read the Peter section to you. You remember that? I read it to you. That's... that's uh, the 13th chapter, verse, we start with verse, verse 36, and, and we, we, we go through uh, the 14th chapter, verse 4. You remember that? And then we come to the Thomas section. If you have a study Bible, you can see that. Now, I, I brought to your attention that Peter asked questions. He asked two questions. Jesus countered with a question. To Each are using it to make a point. To make a point, the point may be, I want you to understand I want to something I want to teach you, or I don't get what you're teaching. Tell, tell me more. I'm not getting it. See, they think they have the answers. Jesus is not getting it. Jesus is giving a counter question and says, no, let me tell you, you're not getting it. And you've got to get it. You've got to get it. So here are some, in the Peter section, let me show you some doctrines that I think were important. For example, in the 13th section, just ahead of where we're at in 36, in verses 31 through 32, he talks about glorification. Glorification. Hmm. I'll tell you, there's a doctor who don't get taught a lot. The glorification. Let me give you an example of what the teaching of glorification is. Would you take your Bible and go with me? I'm just, I'm just going to show you something. Glorification. I'm going to give you a different angle to it because, you know, glorification is about dying and getting your resurrection body glorified. That's one idea. I'm going to show you another one. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 6, 6 chapter 18, 19, and 20. I want to show you something. 6 chapter 18, 19, and 20. Now, I want, you to, I want to drop down to verse 20. And then I'm going to come back. He says, for you have been bought with a price. That's Calvary. That's Golgotha. Therefore, that's a conclusion. Using therefore is a, is a conclusion to what he's talking about. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Christ redeemed you from the slave market of Adamic sin. Your body is no longer to be used for self-pleasure. Your body is now designed to bring God glory. Your body has been designed through conversion, through redemption, to bring glory to God. And he mentions one way you can do it. Listen to me, church. My church, every church is eat up with this. Mine's, mine's not, not an exception to it. Listen to what he says in verse 18. Now you get it. Flee immorality. That's fornication. That's sexual perversions based on what the Bible says. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man, the fornicator, sins against his own body. Listen what he says. Paul asked a question because the people aren't getting it. 
he asked a question. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Point of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside your body, and your body becomes the naos, the place where God dwells, the Holy Spirit. Listen, the Holy Spirit whom you have from, the, from God and that you are not your own, you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And he was dealing with the Corinth people because they were into all kinds of sexual perversions in the church as well as in the world. Do you not know that you have been redeemed? Your body has been redeemed for your life on earth? Just for your life on earth? God converted it spiritually into a temple where the Holy Spirit dwells permanently, John 14, 16, forever. And your body has been redeemed to glorify God in the way it is the way, the way you use it. So Paul says, flee sexual perversions. We're, we're a culture out of the church and in the churches eat up with this idea of sex. We're the failing cult in disguise. I'm going to show you John. Then I'm going to, I'm going to pass over these other. I'm just showing you what could be taught. John 13, 31, 32. When, when therefore he had gone out from the last supper, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. See, he's already dealt with the idea of glorification within the structure of one who is alive in the devil's world. I'm just showing you. You know, when you wind up with a word like glorified or glorification, you look back and see, has there been discussion on it previously? And there had. Another doctrine that could be taught is in the 36 through 33, departure to heaven. A third categorical doctrine is a new commandment for the new covenant. People teach it, and they don't teach it. They teach it out of the old covenant, not for the new. Well, what? Jeez. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Not Moses' disciples, not somebody else's disciples, the disciples of Christ, if you have love for one another. It's a new commandment for the new covenant. People go, well, that's an old commandment. It's a new commandment for the new covenant. It, it's, it's talking to disciples of Christ, not Moses. Jeez. So there's the third categorical doctrine. The fourth categorical doctrine is betrayal of Christ, taught in John 36 through 38. A big subject at the Last Supper, by the way. A fifth doctrine is the Father's house in heaven. I call it hotel heaven. I love the idea that there's plenty of room. <laughs> vacancy. Always got vacancy. Until the rapture of the church, there's always a vacancy sign. Ready for business. I love the idea that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I love that. Here's, and, and so there's five I could get out of Peter's questions section. Peter's question led to Thomas's question and Thomas's section. We read that, so I don't need to read it again. Two doctrines that stand out to me. I've taught many times on it. And you've probably heard a lot about it, but never paid attention to the context. Jeez. Come on, people. Pay attention to context. 
because it, it, it's going to bring a lot more. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. What was he talking about in context? See, that's important. See, we're in the Thomas section that came from the Peter section that came from the Last Supper. The other one, the seventh categorical doctrine that I could teach from this would be the Father and the Son are one. John uh, 14, 6, and 7. In verse 6, he closed out verse 6 by saying, no one comes to the Father except through me. Then he opens up in 7, from now on, you know him and have seen him. What a powerful idea that is. It's already, you've already, you've already, you already know and you've already seen. And that, of course, opened another uh, question, uh, opened up for Philip. And so we go to the Philip section. That my Philip section starts in verse 8 and goes through verse 21. And uh, here are seven categorical doctrines that I could teach from it. That you should be able to see in there. My goodness, you go to church and you can't see this? Jeez. The first one, 8 through 12, is where it has the word believe used a lot. The word believe, it's used in, a lot in that passage. And it's about faith and works. It's not faith versus works. Jesus talked about faith that brings works. You should pay attention to that. You should sure pay attention to that one. Because he's going to come back in another doctrine, my ninth doctrine, in verse 12, greater works. Listen to verse 12. That's the dyna dy dynamic. Truly, truly, I say to you, ooh, you pay attention to that. He who believes in me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Think about that. Greater works than Jesus because he go, he's going to leave. And the Holy Spirit is going to dwell in every person 100%. Think about that. And that's how multiplications get out of whack. I mean, who can multiply that whole ministry of the Holy Spirit maxing out at 100% when you're willing to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh? Wow. Wow. My goodness, people. Greater works. See, I would do a doctrine on that. I would do a doctrine on greater works. Listen, we live in the period of the church age that's called the greater works. Greater works. I, I, I ask myself, am I in that? And what is it based on? It's based on the plan of God and not, and, and not how it's being promoted. It's not about how it's being promoted on earth. It's how it's being promoted in heaven. I mean, the greater works, you may not never see the greater works in the visible eye. They're done by the power of the Holy Spirit. They're done by obedience to the word of God. They're done in casual conversations that light up the world for Christ. Greater works. You know, you can't put, I couldn't put, begin to put it. I mean, is, can a small church with 100 people, can they do greater works? Absolutely. Every individual in that church can do greater works because of the Holy Spirit. I mean, is that important? Is it important that we walk in the power of the Spirit? Yes. Why? If for no other reason, so you can do greater works. And listen, I've never kept up with it. I don't have any idea. I don't, I couldn't begin to, how do you know what's a greater work? I don't know. Ananias, Paul comes to Ananias and said, I just got saved and I don't, I don't know what is and I'm blind and I've had this experience with, with Jesus Christ and 
Ananias says, well, okay, and he, he mentors him for a while, and Paul moves on. You don't hear of Ananias again? This is after Pentecost. This is in the period of the greater works. You know, from a stand, I could stand back and I could say, well, look what happened to Paul. There's his greater works. Listen, the greater work was not what Paul did. Ananias don't get credit for what Paul did. He gets credit for what he did in the moment, in the hour. Listen, Paul, when he, Paul came to him, he had a reputation of being a murderer of the, of the believers. That was quite a moment in his life when, when he has to mentor this guy and take care of this guy. I mean, who knows what greater works are? I mean, who, who knows what that is? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will produce it whether you realize it or not. You may never know it on this time, side, but on the other side, you will certainly know it because you will be rewarded by it. These greater works will be rewarded. You can, you can write that down. The tenth one, that comes to verse 12. The tenth doctrine that I saw in this was found in verses 13 through 15, promises associated with prayer. Not just having prayer, but praying in a specific way in the church age. In the church age, we pray to the Father, according to the Word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. Or you don't pray. Give me none of this stuff. I go to a ball game. I, back several years ago, uh, they asked me if I would, knowing I was going to go to a football a specific game, asked me if I would have a word of prayer. I said, of course I would. When I got there, they told me that they would uh, prefer if I not pray in the name of Jesus. I said that would be impossible. And I explained to them this passage and why it was true. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified. See, I, I, if, I, if I pray a prayer and don't use the name of Jesus, the Father's not glorified by my prayer. Why? I'm in the church age. I don't pray to the Father without the name of Jesus. I don't pray like that. Nobody should pray that kind of a prayer and hope that it would glorify God. Yeah, that's not a prayer. That's not a church prayer. Quit that foolishness. Pass. If you can't pray a prayer in a proper way, don't pray. Jeez. So I didn't pray that day. But let me tell you, I sat in silence and prayed. I didn't have to pray in public to get my prayer heard. I prayed, dear God, what has happened to us in America that at a public event, we can't mention the greatest event that ever occurred in the whole human history, lock, stock, and barrel. Jesus Christ died on a cross, was buried for three days, and raised from the dead. There's no greater, there's no, there's nothing in all of human history that's greater than that one single event. My goodness, what is wrong with us? I'm going to pray it. If you can take me to jail, I'll pray it in jail. And then my 11th doctrine is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which I promise I'll get at to next week. So read ahead. 12, eternal life. I love the way he said this. Verse 19, if I remember, verse 19, listen to this. That's in, that's in the Philip section, by the way. After a little while, the world will behold me no more. But you will behold me because I live, you shall live also. Isn't that a great idea? Because I love. What, you know what he, he just talks about? You're not going to see me anymore. I'm going to die and be buried. 
Happy days, happy days. He's going to be raised from the dead. There's going to be a sad day, and there's going to be a, that, the, the morning day is over. My, my, my. Don't you love that idea? Because I live, you shall live also. The world will behold me no more, but you will. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I love you so much. Thirteenth categorical doctrine. The day of the advent of the Holy Spirit, 19 and 20, after a little while. Verse 20, in that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. You know when that's going to be? Pentecost. Because the Holy Spirit is going to come and take up the place of the other helper, comforter, Jesus Christ. Those are really key ideas. And if you want to read more of it, you go to Acts 1.5 and 2.1. And then I, my final one is in, my final one I would do is the disclosure of the love of God. Now watch this. This is in verse 21. This, I'm still in the Philip section, by the way. Whew. A lot to say in the Philip section. I mean, it, was a lot, it was the longest answer. It was the longest teaching he did was in the Philip section. <laughs> Listen to what he says. He who has my commandments and keeps them. He it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my father. And I will love him. And I will disclose myself to him. You know what Philip? You know what Philip asked? Lord, show us the father and it will be enough for us. He said, I'll show you more than that. Philip, I'll show you so much more than that. I will disclose to you how much love the Father has for you. When you see what he did for you through me. Isn't that wonderful? Well, thank you for coming our way today. Next week, we will get to our passage, so read ahead. It's in the Philip section. And we will talk about this wonderful doctrine of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the church age. Father, we're thankful for these who have come our way today by the automobile and as well as the Internet. Some are going to say, there were people came. Yeah, yeah. Some people came knowing I was going to teach. Ain't that interesting? Well, we thank you, Father, for the Internet. We've been able to feed a whole lot of people the truth. I pray, Father, that what we've thought of today is when you study the Bible, study to see what all Jesus is teaching you. Don't just take a swig. Drink the whole bottle. For I've made my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.